Oh, hello, everybody. Good, good evening. Um, welcome to Say No to Book Bans, um, presented by 540 West Main and Writers and Books. My name is Calvin Eaton, and I will be um, your co-moderator this evening. We're really excited to um, be bringing this program to all of you and also be having some really dynamic discussion with a wonderful panel of um, guest speakers and experts from our community, authors, librarians, etc. So if you're new to 540 West Main, just to go to the next slide and tell you a little bit about our organization, we are a virtual nonprofit anti-racist education platform and through classes, digital content and consulting, we provide the tools needed to dismantle racism at the personal, institutional and policy levels. You can learn more about the work that we do as a nonprofit by visiting our website, 540westmain.org. Um, and um, we'll be putting links to um, our, 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 about the conversation in the chat throughout the program. And we also really highly recommend and encourage you to put questions and comments that you have throughout the program, um, even before we get to our dedicated Q&A section of, of the panel. Um, Writers and Books is a literary center in Rochester and also the co-organizer and presenter of this program. Um, Writers and Books promotes reading and writing as a lifelong activity for people of all ages and backgrounds to enrich their lives and the intellectual, social, cultural vibrancy of our community. Um, we're really excited to be have been working with Writers and Books um, more intimately over the last two years or so um, and, and really have some excited, exciting programming that they're they're having around reading um, throughout the fall as well. So you can learn more about their work, um, their their bookstore. They also have an indie bookstore, which we'll talk a little bit more about later as well, called ampersandbooks.org. And I believe the web the URL is writersandbooks.org or wab.org. Um, officially. So thank you, um, the writers and books team. Um, for those of you who, um, as well, in terms of objectives for what we'll learn for our program today, and really what we um, as curators and panelists want you to leave this program having thought about, um, and we'll be providing some additional resources around what we talk about in terms of censorship, freedom of speech, um, book challenges and book bans um, after the class. So um, those who registered, will, um, stay tuned for that. Um, the first objective of what you'll learn is a history of book banning and how it impacts free speech, um, intergenerational intersectional perspectives from authors, librarians, and others involved in the literary industry with an emphasis on the Latinx experience. Um, we're really excited as an organization to also be highlighting and honoring Hispanic Heritage Month throughout the month of September as well. Um, and it sort of aligns really well with, with this program and the censorship of um, particularly artists who have historically been oppressed and who come from identities and communities that have not been centered historically globally and also in the United States. And really um, ending with some action that you can take. We'll talk about a lot of negativity um, uh, culturally and in, in, in our society, but we really do want you to leave this program feeling inspired to continue reading, to continue supporting local authors, authors from historically oppressed backgrounds, and really supporting your local libraries and also um, your local indie bookstores, which we have several in the Rochester community. Um, but you also might be joining and watching from another community. And so we, we highly recommend and encourage you to support bookstores, local bookstores, um, the non-Amazons of the world um, as much as possible um, throughout this conversation. Um, so without further ado, just one more announcement before I forget. Um, typically for our programs, we do offer um, live ASL interpreting. Unfortunately, um, our interpreters were not able to join us this evening. Um, so we do apologize for that. We do have live captioning um, turned on for this program. Um, and so we, we really thank you for bearing with us as we um, you know, go throughout the program without our ASL interpreting. Um, I'm going to turn over the virtual microphone to um, my co-moderator or co-MC, um, Dan Hurd, who is the Director of Adult Programs at Writers and Books, who will be introducing Allison Myers, our lead moderator for the evening. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Calvin. Um, 
it's great to be here. I'm the director of adult programs. Uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, other moderator, Allison Myers. Uh, she is a poet and fiction writer, twice nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Her work can be found in Hole in the Head Review, Ragazine, Freshwater Review, Stone Canoe, Mom Egg, and other literary journals, and in the anthology Gathered Light. Writers respond to the poetry of Joni Mitchell. The executive director of Writers and Books, she previously served as Kaveh Kanem Foundation's executive director from 2006 to 2016, and poetry director and director of marketing and communications at the Hillstead Museum in Connecticut. For many years, she owned and managed indie bookstores. She serves on the board of Quayley Journal, presents at AWP and other conferences, serves frequently as grants and awards panelist, and consults as a lit chat mentor. You can find her online at allisonmyers.com. Allison, thank you for being here. Such a pleasure to join this um, high-powered panel. We have some terrific panelists tonight and um, welcome everyone who's tuning in as well. So many thanks to Calvin and his team for organizing this. You did uh, mad work on this and we're grateful. So I am going to ask our esteemed panelists to please introduce themselves and we'll just go slide by slide. So uh, at the top, we'll start with uh, Alex. Well, hey, everyone. It's uh, great to be here with you all. And um, there's sort of a longish bio there. But uh, what I'll say is that uh, I am originally an immigrant from Mexico and been living in the Rochester area now for about uh, five years, loving it. And I'm a young adult and a middle grade and graphic novel uh, author. And I'll tell you more about myself a little later on when I uh, make my presentation. It's great to be here. Thank you all. Wonderful, Alex. Our next panelist um, on the next slide, please. Kiana, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I am Kiana Joseph Muhammad. Uh, I am currently the program director at The Hub 585, um, where we focus on connecting families and youth with programming that helps them thrive and gives them hope. Uh, I also uh, am the founder of WombWomanWarrior.com, which is a blog site where women can share their various stories regarding various facets of their life. Finally, um, this past year, we at the Hub 585 had a program that I developed where we turned seven local youth in the Rochester area into published authors, and they published their book, The Voices of Hope, Volume One, and released it this past August. You can find that on Amazon. Wonderful work you're doing. Amazing. Thank you. Let's talk, let's uh, hear from our next panelist, please, Beth. Hi, um, I'm Beth Merkel. I am, um, I have been a librarian for 23 years now. Um, I started out in public libraries and have worked in um, Virginia and South Carolina and then um, made my way back um, to the Rochester area. And um, since 2014, I've been the director of the libraries and archives at the Strong National Museum of Play here in Rochester. Um, at the museum, we have um, two libraries. One is the Research Library and Archives, and the other is a mini branch of the Rochester Public Library, um, where you can um, spread out through the exhibits. You can check out books with your Monroe County Library System card. Um, and uh, thank you. And Beth, you have a regional, or you have a regional role oh. as well. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting that I'm the president of the New York Library Association. <laughs> So, um, which is the, um, we're actually the oldest state library association in the country. And um, so I'm on a list of uh, presidents now that starts with Melville Dewey. And right now at the end of the list is me. So um, dubious honor to me. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Let's look at our next slide and ask Rachel, please introduce yourself. Hello, thank you so much for having me today. Um, currently, I'm a bookstore owner of Akimbo Bookshop uh, right on um, Easton Union in downtown Rochester. I have experience as a bookseller, as an editor, um, as a writer, and um, a little bit with academic publishing as well. 
Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, it's great to have your voice at the table and everyone please visit her absolutely beautiful, uh, beautiful shop in so many ways inside, inside the covers and outside the covers. Let's see who is next on our slides. Wonderful, Adrian. Hi, I'm Adrian Pantnelli. I'm the director of the Henrietta Public Library. I've been here uh, 10 years. This year, prior to that, I was a children's librarian for many, many years and dealt with a lot of book challenges uh, through the years. I always say at the rate of about one or two a year for my 23-year career, uh, Beth and I are in for the same number. <laughs> seems to be a magic one. Uh, I am a children's literature specialist. Also, I've served on a lot of children's book award committees and reviewed children's books with a particular focus in picture books and beginning readers. Thank you so much. Our librarians are such heroes to our culture, so it's such a pleasure to have you here. Next up is a wonderful YA author, Francesca Padilla. Hi, everybody. My name is Francesca Padilla. I am a Dominican American uh, fiction writer, primarily of young adult fiction. Um, from uh, born and raised in New York City and um, longtime resident of Rochester. Um, and my debut novel, What's Coming to Me, was just released last month from Soho Teen, which is an imprint of Soho Press, which is known for a lot of really wonderful, wonderful works. Um, of fiction um, and other things. <laughs> and um, I, yeah, I have a lot going on and I'm really excited to tell you about it later on in uh, the presentation. I do wanna mention that I also work in um, health and human services, um, I guess most notably for this audience at 211 Lifeline. Um, and I still have a really strong connection to it. So I, um, and the reason I mention that is because my, my work uh, in identifying and helping improve connections to community resources is not only really important to me, but it informs the writing that I do. So that's me. And you're a parent. You're doing it all, Francesca. I am oh. a parent. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's see what our next slide is. I'm not sure we've introduced everyone. Um, one, okay, Catherine or Kate, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kate Hamill, and I um, am currently working in the role of a school library system director at Wayne Finger Lakes OCs. Um, but in my previous to working at OCs, I worked as an elementary school librarian for many years in the Greece Central School District. Um, my work at OCs involves supporting um, the 25 component school districts that comprise of the Wayne Finger Lakes BOCES region. So it's Ontario County, Wayne County, and little bits of Seneca and Yates County. Um, and what we do is provide resources, services, support, training to all things related to school libraries in the region. Thank you. That's a very large job. We appreciate you. Um, let us see what is next up. Okay, um, I, Adrian, are you the person? Yes, Adrian, yes, please. Uh, if you can take us through this, um, I know you have more to say than what is on the on the um, on the cue card, but we'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the history of book bands. Okay, um, obviously, this is a whole field of study in itself. Uh, so we're going to get the 50 cent version here, uh, kind of some of the uh, greatest hits of book banning uh, in America. So <laughs> the Europeans got to this continent and it immediately started trying to control things, including information. The Puritans were really well known for, uh, you know, book burnings, holding burnings, uh, and, and banning lots of things. Um, this Thomas Morton's uh, New English Canaan was banned because it made fun of the Puritans. Uh, so that's one I haven't read. The rest of the ones that I'm going to talk about uh, have been, uh, are ones I've read. Uh, so I can talk about them a little bit. 
I think if you aren't used to book bans and book challenges, sometimes it can be really surprising what gets challenged and banned and why, um, or at least what the stated reasons are, which are not always the actual reason. Um, sometimes people use things as kind of masks. So a lot of things that you would consider classic works have been banned since the day they were published. Uh, so a great example uh, is Leaves of Grass. I grabbed our copy in the library by Walt Whitman. Uh, it came out in 1855. Um, reasons it was banned, uh, it was shocking, too sexual and explicit. And if you haven't read Leaves of Grass, I spent a little time with it uh, today just to remind myself and it is refreshing actually, uh, and, and charming. Uh, lines specifically mentioned by book banners. Uh, here's one. When he whom I love travels with me or sits a, a long while holding me by the hand. And so that's a man holding a man's hand considered worthy of banning a book. Um, not just in its original publication day, but still today, things like that are cited in this book as a reason that it shouldn't be in libraries or studied. So um, another one, of course, that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with is The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, uh, originally published in 1885, called Racist, Trashy, and Mindless, uh, and the year of its publication uh, continued to be called all those things. Uh, and certainly there's elements of all three living in here. Uh, also a lot to discuss and talk about, uh, obviously, but this one's really interesting because it gets challenged by people from different political leanings in that, you know, some people are concerned about the portrayal of people of color in this book, uh, justifiably so. Uh, other people um, don't like how independent Huck Huckleberry Finn is, the main character. So it's it's interesting for that reason. Um, Adrian, could I interject um, one small yeah. bit of information? There's an entire institute devoted to the study of uh, not just Mark Twain, but the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. That's how complex and, and um, interesting that text is. Yeah, it's something that I love about banned books. I find that anytime I see a banned book list, I find it's among my favorite books um, are always on it. And I think it's because there's a lot to talk about. You know, something I like to think about is what doesn't get banned? You know, like the James Patterson books in my collection that have horrific depictions of violence committed against women never get Nobody ever mentions that, you know, but this book, Where the Wild Things Are, has been banned since it was published in 1963 for being too dark and scary and psychologically damaging to children. Um, librarians actually were among the first haters of this book, sadly, um, but it, uh, boy, if you've ever read this to a group of children, they grow silent and watchful and it's wonderful. Um, but people really hate this book. Uh, the Color Purple by Alice Walker, originally published in 1982, graphic sexual content and violence, which is like literally the point of the book, right? To examine and talk about that. Uh, but that's been used as a reason for it not to be read. Um, and then a more recent example, uh, another book I really love, Entangled Makes Videos, was published in 2005. This is a, a nonfiction picture book about two penguins, uh, two male penguins at, um, in the zoo uh, in Central Park, New York City, that raised a chick together. And so people um, object to this book because it's two male penguins raising a, a chick, which is absurd. It's real to start um, and super charming, but these these are the kinds of, I'm inserting my opinion a lot here, but uh, it's weird to try to ban reality. <laughs> but well, of, I think it's great, Adrian, that you're giving us the context because outside of these uh, squeaky wheels and these voices, 
there is all this positive reception and critical reception of these texts. So I think it's really important that you share with us the other receptions of the books. Yeah, and I think something I really learned working on book award committees is I think when I was younger, I used to think there was this perfect book out there. You know, like this perfect book that was the most best example of a thing, but that doesn't exist. Books are all problematic, in my opinion. And uh, so the whole thing that's interesting about them is actually these things that you can discuss. Now, some are very problematic and maybe you don't want to read them, but uh, that's that's kind of the point. Anyway, so I've given you a lot of examples through the years. I do want to mention in the 1980s, there was a, a very uh, strong movement, a religiously motivated movement led um, by Jerry Falwell. He started this moral majority group and they did a lot of book banning that looks a lot like what we're seeing now. Um, you know, and Beth is going to uh, talk to us more about that, but it's different too, but it definitely was organized, particular types of books were being challenged. Uh, so I, I wanted to mention that because I feel like that was the last wave that got a lot of publicity, um, like what we see today. But I'm going to bounce this over to Kate and she's going to give us some vocabulary. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you. So, um, you know, you just mentioned, Ellison, the, the notion of giving context to this. And I think an, an important piece of that is kind of thinking about um, and differentiating a little bit between a book ban versus a book challenge. And so, um, you know, according to the American Library Association, um, speaking of definitions, the difference between a challenge and a banning is the challenge is an attempt to remove or restrict the materials based on the objections of a person or a group, whereas the banning is the actual removal of those said materials. Um, and so what is what has been proliferating quite a bit, um, I think in this region, in school and public libraries across the state, across the country is finding a, a exponentially growing larger number of book challenges happening in, in multiple settings. So to kind of think about um, book challenges, it's also important to note that there's kind of a continuum of challenges. And so kind of starting um, with what is considered to be an informal complaint where a community member, a library patron, uh, a, a parent, a family member may complain about um, a particular text or book in question, um, but it doesn't really trigger any formal action moving along to what is considered to be a formal challenge. So that would be when a challenge is put forth typically in school or public libraries, there's some type of, as part of the policy, a form uh, often referred to as a reconsideration form. I think Adrian mentioned that. And so there's a, there's a process, there's a timeline, it involves different stakeholders, committees, and so on and so forth, and making decisions around whether or not a book would stay in a, in a library school, school or public library collection. Um, and then ranging up to challenges going to um, the school and or library board. Um, and this is where we see things kind of getting more politicized in terms of the organized action of certain groups um, kind of challenging at the heart of what those policies are and targeting school boards or library boards um, in that manner. And actually, Adrian um, has experienced that firsthand, as we will point out in her article a little bit later. And then all the way kind of at the top is actually, you know, filing complaints with the um, education commissioner. Um, and so it, the way that these scenarios like play themselves out in school and public libraries vary. Um, it's just important to note that that these challenges are growing in number and uh, in different types. And then the next slide is kind of like a, a little insight or a how-to on on what 
to do if whatever role um, you may be, like as we are in this panel, librarians, authors, bookstore owners, et cetera. Um, what, what do you do? And um, this is content that I give credit to and borrowed from um, a Buffalo-based attorney, um, Stephanie Cole Adams, who specializes a lot of her legal work in providing um, support and guidance for school and public libraries. And she has recently done a lot of work um, with library stakeholders in this area. And so I borrowed her acronym, um, when challenged, remain calm. And so first, first piece in the puzzle is, you know, recognizing, confirming, affirming that you recognize the person does have a concern. It's, you know, a legitimate concern, no matter which political, you know, whether or not it's political, it's still important to be open to accepting that a person does have a concern. Um, assure them that it will be addressed, that this whole idea of listening without arguing, and she makes a point of saying, nor apologizing. Um, you know, often when you're put into a situation like this, it can be very intimidating. It can feel very personal, and certainly librarians who have been in this situation feel oftentimes personally under attack. Um, and so kind of a knee-jerk response may be this apology, but it's important not to apologize, um, but rather to listen and have that idea of, you know, recognizing the concern. Um, and then, you know, the M in calm is really, and this is kind of at the heart of it as well, managing the situation according to both law and policy. And, you know, at the end of the day, a really piece to, to strengthen the role and, and, and the position of school libraries, school boards, superintendents, public libraries, library boards of trustees is it comes down to policy, 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 making sure that policies with the big P are written to help guide these situations. And then under the umbrella of policy to be sure that there are um, clearly established, well communicated with both staff in the library or the district, as well as the community members um, around what those exact protocols and procedures may be. And so that's kind of a, a way to, to, as I said, strengthen the position if and when a challenge should happen. Um, Kate, do you have um, general best practices for policy protocols and procedures, or does it vary a lot from district to district? Uh, that, it, that's a good point. So it's interesting um, in New York State, for those of you who may or may not be familiar, is, as I mentioned, I work for a BOCES, and um, BOCES is actually itself an acronym, and BOCES stands for Board of Cooperative Education Services. Oftentimes when people hear BOCES, they first think about the special education services that many BOCES provide um, to school districts and individual students across the state. And that's a huge piece of what BOCES do. But another piece that BOCES do is to um, really work and provide support through collaborative services. So there is in fact a policy service that is run through Erie One BOCES in the Buffalo area that many, many school districts from across the state kind of work and have exemplars and guidance on policies through that service. So in actuality, there is, and I think this is, this is a good thing, there is some consistency across the state in what those umbrella policies may look like as it comes to challenge materials, both in a library and curricular materials as well, class materials. With that being said, each district then kind of has their autonomy and their ability to make something much more custom to the district needs within those, those protocols and procedures. Thank you so much. This has been illuminating. Let's see what's next. Oh, All right. Yeah. So um, 
as as we heard, um, you know, um, book challenges and bans are sort of perennial, um, and the titles have changed, and the intensity to the opposition, um, the intensity of the opposition to their publication and dis distribution has sort of ebbed and flowed. Uh, but the current environment of book challenges is quite alarming in a number of ways. Um, what I'm going to um, summarize is, is taken from the recently published PEN America's Index of School Book Bans, and it covers uh, July 2021 through June um, 2022. So it's focused on school book bans, but it really translates to what public libraries are seeing as well. Um, so one of the major changes um, that Adrian hinted to with um, hearkening back to the 80s um, is who, who is initiating these challenges. So at least 40% of the bans analyzed are connected to either proposed or enacted legislation or to political pressure exerted by state officials or elected lawmakers. In addition, PEN America has identified at least 50 groups involved in pushing for book bans across the country operating at the national, state, and local level. Most of these groups, including their uh, over 300 chapters, appear to have formed since 2021. These parent and community groups have played a role in at least half of the book bans enacted across the country during the school year. So 20% um, of the book bans could be um, directly linked to the actions of the group. And then another 30% um, show evidence of the group's likely influence, um, including the use of common language or tactics. Um, the changes of sort of what and why um, they are challenging. Um, the numbers show that uh, at this point, about 41% um, of the books challenged explicitly address LGBTQ plus themes or have protagonists or prominent secondary characters who are LGBTQ plus. 40% um, contain protagonists or prominent secondary characters of color. 21% directly address issues of race and racism. 22% contain sexual content of varying kinds, including novels with some level of description of sexual experiences of teenagers, um, stories of teen pregnancy, um, sexual assault and abortion, as well as informational books about puberty. Um, and 10% uh, have themes related to rights and activism. Um, and sort of how, how they are challenging and sort of the tone of the challenge, which I think is, is one of the biggest things that we're seeing. Um, so the number of challenges has increased. So in um, 2020, ALA reported um, 273 challenges, and then that was up to 729 in 2021. And then so far um, through the end of August this year, we're up to 681. And these are probably underreported because this is all self-reporting to ALA. Um, and the other major change, um, and if you, if you follow any um, banned book hashtags on, on Twitter, you're gonna get so many articles, um, just the online uh, vitriol, the doxing and the trolling, um, make the current um, spate of book challenges quite unique. And I just pulled out a, a couple of headlines that sort of to me illustrate what's different now. Um, so Amanda Jones, um, she's a school uh, librarian in Louisiana, and I think she's also president of the School Library um, Association in Louisiana. So she's um, actually suing two men for defamation after they accused her of advocating to keep pornographic materials in the parish library's kids section. So they had formed these Facebook groups and were attacking her and she said enough's enough and she's um, suing them. So <laughs> um, Oklahoma Secretary of Education, Ryan Walters called on the State Board of Education to revoke the teaching certificate of Summer Bosmere, a former teacher at Norman High School. Um, the teacher had posted a QR code that directed students to the Brooklyn Public Library's Books on Band project, which gives young people across the country access to books that might be outlawed in their schools. Um, and romance novelist Nora Roberts uh, donated uh, at least $50,000 to help keep the doors of the Patmos Library in Michigan open. So the library was defunded in early August um, over a, a fight over LGBTQ themed books. Um, they wanted, um, I think, at least three titles removed and um, 
the uh, board, the library refused. And so they um, ran a campaign to get the library defunded. And Nora Roberts saw it and had to <laughs> donate money to keep it open. A group of conservative Christians inundated the staff and board of a public library in Bonners Ferry, Idaho with complaints about books they didn't want to see on the shelves. So they provided a list of more than 400 titles predominantly focused on young adult books with LG LGBTQ characters, um, scenes describing sexual activity or invoking the occult. And um, the only thing is this library was a very small library. They didn't have any of these books, but still they, um, then they went, wanted a, a preemptive um, uh, statement that they would never buy these four books like this at all. Um, and then this list of 400 books is actually comes from a, um, a, a legislator in, in Texas who produced this, this list of like, it's three to 400 books that he got by, with keywords um, from a local catalog that uh, that's what you should be banning. And then my favorite um, in Orange County, Florida, bestselling author John Green spoke out against a school board candidate's call to have his novel looking for Alaska banned from the school libraries. Turns out he graduated from the Orange County school system. Um, and on TikTok, he stated, please don't ban my books in my hometown. It's really upsetting for my mom. She has to deal with all these people talking to her on Facebook now. So, um, just some of the the links that these groups are going to and it's usually groups that are going to um to really um, um instill fear and in in libraries and and individual librarians by you know taking away their funding um revoking their, their teaching licenses um it's just sort of above and beyond um what at least i've seen documented in the history of book banning um, Beth, aside yeah. from the uh, political climate, is uh, the proliferation of social media and use of the internet allowing these groups to coalesce and organize and therefore be more impactful? Yes, for sure. The um, um, they and it's and it's it's similar for a lot of other uh, political groups. The um, um, social media has has allowed people from all over the country, you know, all over the world to connect, um, share ideas, um, which is which is great. Um, but it can also be ideas that you um, might not um, agree with, and um, it you know and it and it shows that in in some of the the challenges and bannings, the um, similar language that's used, it really shows that this concerted effort, the same list of 400 books that originates with one person and it is and it's pushed to all these groups. Um, and um, yeah, it definitely has made it easier for, for groups to, to share strategy and to, um, to organize. I guess the silver lining in that is that those platforms are available for those of us who want to yeah. resist Right, right. They're also, yes, they're also available for us to get information like this out um, and also information like um, what uh, Kate was just sharing, the how, you know, how important policy is, um, how to um, how to address these concerns um, with by by the policy that, that you have established. And one of the things I didn't um, include in this, but it, you can read it in the, the pen report is that of the challenges that they analyzed, 96% of, of the, the bans were resulted because the, the pol stated policy um, and ALA guidelines were not followed. So only 4% went through that process that, that Kate just, you know, Kate and Adrian have, have talked about the, you know, request to reconsider. And then it goes to a committee, it's, it's looked at. Um, the vast majority of, of the, bans that um, PEN America analyzed for did not follow stated, stated policy. So it's sort of skipping ahead um, and not following um, stated mm -hmm. procedure. That's what's so great for those of us who are not as steeped in the field, the library, the library field is you all are, we're aware now that there are some vehicles for, uh, you know, really kind of moving, changing the, the direction of the tide a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's see if um, I know we have some more on this 
uh, uh, topic coming up, book challenge resources. And I think we are going to be uh, hearing from Beth, Kate, and Adrian around book challenge resources. Yeah, this um, is actually, and um, if you someone can go ahead and just click on that. Yep, I'm, and I'll throw this in the chat as well. This is essentially the fact that we're librarians, of course, we're gonna curate resources. <laughs> um, so can't help it. Um, so what we kind of did is compile um, different links and resources. If you you know are interested in this topic, you wanna learn more and explore further some of what we've talked about, um, they're all compiled here in, in this um, format. Um, so we certainly would encourage you. And like I said, I'm gonna throw this in the chat in just a second. Um, there is, I wanted to point out, oh, Calvin already did it, thank you. Um, the, the pen report that Beth was just referring to, as well as Adrian was recently published in um, Horn Magazine, an article the, about her very real experiences in the Henrietta Library, um, kind of reflecting what we just talked about. So I would encourage everyone to kind of go through that and click and uh, that's it. We will. I'd also encourage everyone to just uh, sign up for PEN America's uh, uh, announcements that come through into your inbox because it's they exist at that intersection of literature and uh, rights. And so they're doing amazing work. The organization has um, grown its five times the size uh, and uh, that it was even um, five years ago. It's amazing. So it's just such an interesting organization to hear from in an ongoing Did I glitch out a little bit, Allison? I think. I can you, can you I'm not seeing anything um, next. So if you are, Calvin, could you pick up the conversation? Yeah, um, we can hop back in, into the slides. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I my sometimes my Wi-Fi cuts out here, so uh, my apologies. Um, so I think that we we've got a lot of context, and we've we've sort of shared. The panelists so far have shared the, the the history of this long-standing history of book challenges um, and complaints not being new. And I think that what we wanted to provide is some additional global context that this is not just um, an issue that we are dealing with here in the United States and have been for many decades um, and century, you know, centuries really. But um, we know that the Bible is 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 one a book that has often been banned, burned, um, you know, there has been, there have been attacks on it being um, translated across languages. And the Catholic Church for a long time. Um, and, and even just recently, we've had the Bible been being put on lists of book bans, um, even just in the last couple of months. Um, in 1958, um, this author, Boris Pasternak from Russia, um, what was formerly the Soviet Union, now Russia, um, was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize for, for his novel, Dr. Hivako and Soviet authorities at that time um, basically forced him to turn down that prize at the time. And most recently, the author, um, Salman Rushdie, was actually ambushed um, in New York City at the beginning of a lecture and stabbed in the abdomen and neck um, around um, decades long um, conversation around his book that he wrote in the 1980s called The Satanic Verses. So he had death threats for years and um, really all, all also went into hiding for a number of years and made a decision recently to um, face the public and have a conversation. It was at the beginning of a book talk or lecture and he, he was stabbed. Fortunately, he was able to survive that attack. Um, so we, we see that um, unfortunately, 
what 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 is a, what we think is a vocal minority can have a lot of pull, can have a lot of de deleterious effects on authors, um, with people getting death threats. And now that we've added the context of social media to the conversation, there's things like doxing that happens where people post your address, the address of your families, and you really um, deal with severe in incessant harassment, online harassment, emails, letters that, that, that are sent to authors and many people relieve social media for a time, um, contemporary authors especially because of how quickly social media can really proliferate disinformation and negative attacks on authors. And so unfortunately, this is a global conversation. We know that um, we're fortunate to have many freedoms in the United States, but we know that other countries like China and, and many others around the world um, do sanction and really do um, issue edicts against many books in their in their country, um, Animal Farm in 1984 being one of them that I discussed earlier with Allison, which is, I think 1984 might be one of the most banned books um, globally, if that's the correct statistic. So um, there's a lot of, of context to this that's not just the United States, but really around the world. Um, Calvin, I might <clears throat> add to your comments that when um, censorship and book banning rises to the level of being part of state policy, which obviously at the federal level, we of course want to avoid at all costs here, but in other countries, there's a, an effect of censorship that is not even after the books are published, but preventing authors from ever even writing or publishing their books to begin with. So it really becomes such, um, such an oppressive kind of thing. Um, there's an organization called City Cities of Asylum, which have been doing that kind of work and um, providing refuge for writers to come to this country and some of the European countries so that they can really kind of restart their careers as writers. Um, but I think when we look at that journey and that trajectory, I think we can't, <laughs> these are cautionary tales for us in this country that we consider a democracy. Absolutely. Thank you, Allison. And um, it, it becomes a very serious issue. You know, I think that we we don't have that at this time in, our, in the United States, but it is um, an issue that many people and writers and authors around the world do face where they're forced out of, of a country because of, of their writing and their views. So um, we don't want that to happen in this country, but you know, this is why we have these conversations so that we can prevent that level of censorship. Um, I did wanna just know, um, there was a couple of comments in the chat a little earlier, one from Frank, who shared in the, in the 70s, the conservative organization Parents of New York United, P-O-N-Y-U, created the list of books that was the basis of the books initially removed in the Island Tree School District High School and Junior High School Libraries. And I think Adrian a little earlier shared as well that every book challenge that Adrian has personally dealt with has been about LGBTQ plus content. Um, there's a lot of uh, conversations around that and challenges to books that feature any aspect of um, LGBTQ experience. Um, Alex will be talking more about that during um, some of his remarks or their remarks. And also the book, um, All Boys, I think the title of the book is, so the, the author is George M. Johnson, who uses they, them pronouns. And um, their book, All Boys Aren't Blue, I, I might be saying the name of the book wrong, but we'll put it in the chat. It's, it's definitely um, on the top of my mind of an author, a contemporary author, I'm a Black author who is experiencing some very severe online harassment and censorship or attempted censorship from their, their latest book, um, which is a young adult. Yes, All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. So um, we're going to move segue into um, some conversation from Rachel Crawford, who's the owner of Akimbo Books, to talk a little bit about the giving some perspective and context on how these conversations impact indie bookstores um, or not. So thank you, Rachel. 
Hello, it's so good to be here in conversation with all of you. Um, just a couple of things my mind is going as we're having this conversation and as we're talking, and it's it's true, um, we can go to the, the next slide. It's true that indie bookstores do function a little differently than your libraries and your school boards, which is why it's so important to support librarians, to speak up to your local school board, um, as everyone has been saying, but it's, it's, it's ultimately very important. I think Allison touched on the fact that in order to even initiate these bans, um, you have to be incredibly organized and um, you have to mobilize as well. And so that means that we have to be organized and mobilized also. Um, and so this is just, um, uh, what I have up on the screen here, this is exactly what we've been talking about, this PEN America report. Um, every three and a half hours, a school district facing a book banner challenge. That's that's wild in this country. Um, it's it, I know we're sick of the word, um, but it's truly unprecedented. It's horrifying. Um, and we should we should really start talking about why it's horrifying. So earlier, um, Adrian had talked a little bit about, um, you know, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And, and one of the reasons that that book had been challenged and or banned, one of which was racism. But, you know, this is exactly why we can't ban Toni Morrison, right? I've taken college courses where you read um, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn in tandem with Playing in the Dark by Toni Morrison, where she talks about the Africanist presence in her American novels. Um, and so we, we shouldn't be banning these titles, we should be learning how to talk about them um, sensitively. Um, and so uh, we can go to the next slide. I, those. Those are just images of the exact reports we've all been talking about, but I don't think we can really talk about it um, enough. So indie indie bookstores are really different. I mean, we we don't have boards or committees, not all of which are politically motivated, but they can be in some towns, um, in some um, areas in the country. They shouldn't be, which is the conversation we're trying to have right now. But, but independent bookstores don't have those. So when you're talking about um, a shop like Akimbo, which is my store, um, you know, and you wanna talk about some titles that have been known for being banned, one of them is The Hate You Give. And one of the reasons that that title, one of the um, justifications for banning or challenging it has been because it's anti-police or um, social indoctrination and like, oh my, don't come into my store <laughs> if, if that's an issue. Uh, we have a lot of books on abolition here. We have a lot of books on restorative justice and um, a lot of information uh, for those who may be curious on why policing systems don't always work and um, why communities with the most resources are the safest. Um, and that includes well-funded libraries, uh, like, you know, in addition to recreation programs and healthcare and, um, after school programs and all of those things. And uh, that's exactly why, you know, that information, in my opinion, is very important to share with the public. So, you know, the fact that that's a justification for banning a book to me is a reason to carry it. Um, and I get to make that choice. And that's very exciting for me. Um, I've not been doxxed. I've, my shop has only been open since um, April 30th. And I've run other bookstores before. However, um, you know, I also, because this is this is a space that is my job to keep safe, means that there's a level of bravery that comes with it. And that means advocating for my community, um, which we should do all of the time, not just um, when we're running our, 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 you know, these handing these books out to folks, we should also just be doing that all the time. And so being involved in your community is really important, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so yeah, so so there, so that's a big component of it is, is being brave enough to say that people are gonna walk into my store and maybe be put off a little bit. Um, a lot of small bookstores tend to be niche. So you may have, um, in Rochester, we have more conservative, specifically Christian bookshops, and there's a clientele for that. There's an audience for that. Um, and you're going to know when you're walking into a bit more of a radical or leftist bookshop when it has a name like The Wooden Shoe in Philly or Burning Books in um, Buffalo, New York, which I love, or when it's Akimbo, which is a feminist 
uh, stance, you know, superwoman's stance, the fearless girl in front of the Wall Street bull, right? Um, and so people who, who may walk in may kind of know coming, you know, like, okay, um, I have books that are, you know, maybe further left than people like to even, uh, that some things that get a little touchier, like we saw on Evan Dawson's show and in WXXI with, um, you know, um, Black voices speaking up for Palestine. There's a lot of Palestinian liberation in my store. So I get to make those choices is, is basically what I'm saying. And I love community input. I love discussing it with folks. Um, the point to which I can choose ethically what my um, inventory looks like is not just about social justice. It's also keeping money in my community. We have BOA and Open Letter Books right here in our backyard publishing. We have those books on these shelves. We need to make sure that we're taking care of um, those folks. And um, those presses are run by very few people and they put out um, incredible work. So there's a lot that kind of comes with it. Um, and, you know, because of that, uh, indie bookstores are, are hugely indicative of a, a city or a community's economic health. And so I have that um, on the bottom of this slide here that says, you know, for every 10 million in sales, they create 47 jobs as opposed to the 19 that Amazon creates. And um, I'm also a single mom. Uh, and this place is run by one person. We had 14 events in our first 10 weeks with no staff. <laughs> so um, when you shop in an indie bookstore, um, you're feeding my family and I make sure that I go to places like Ugly Duck and Happy Gut and make sure that I feed their families too. Um, so it's a way of keeping us all connected together. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and so that's that's the big thing for me as well. Um, libraries are also community spaces. Bookstores are community spaces. Um, and so, you know, especially bookstores that have the cafe element to them, they're meant to be a little more social, right? So they're not necessarily quiet spaces. You can be an introvert in a bookstore and you can be a high level extrovert in a bookstore and come to um, multimedia events that are not just literary, right? So books have book covers that are done by artists. Their whole job is to create a cover for this book. Um, and so we also have visual art in the store regularly, um, everything from yoga, we have, um, you know, activist community events, meetings, um, teach-ins as well. Um, so, so it's very important that bookstores remain um, a social place where we are learning and discussing, especially when the topic's hard, especially when the topic is scary, especially when um, a book is being banned and we're not asking why, what is, what is it about? Uh, you open it, look at it, um, and let's talk about it. And, um, and let's have book clubs and, um, be adults about it, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, cafes are where the French and U.S. revolutions began. So when, uh, shops like I have coffee and, um, we'll have kombucha and things like that at Akimbo, um, where people can just sit and work quietly, but they can also come and meet and, and talk about things um, that are happening in the community. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And we're um, a little stuffy too. So if I'm a little hard to understand, just uh, feel free to, to chime in and raise a hand and ask. Um, so I just had a couple of reflection questions so that when we get to the Q and A, if these, if you want to chew on these a little bit or think about them, um, they're questions that I'm interested in. I don't have answers to them, but I thought that they were provocative. So, um, we know that censorship isn't really new and that ratings aren't new, but books that fall in this really strange category. So with music and movies, um, when it comes to letting your children see what, you know, a, a particular movie, you can say it's rated R. Um, they can't go without a parent, or um, maybe you just don't want it in your home, or it's explicit content on music. Um, books aren't rated, which I'm not suggesting that they should be uh, at all. I have a teenager. Um, everything's up for grabs in my household as long as we can have a conversation about what it is. Um, and that's just how I run my household. But I'm not suggesting that books have ratings, but I am curious why books are either um, allowed or completely not allowed. <laughs> this is very curious to me. 
um, that they function so differently than other media. And then I had another one on the next slide as well. And the other thing that I've been thinking about a lot during this Banned Books Week is um, in activism right now, uh, I, do, I do a lot of volunteering and a lot of community work as much as I can. And one of the things that I'm noticing across the board, regardless of the subject, is that we are scrambling to keep what we have and not slide backwards. In some cases, we're scrambling just to get back where we were yesterday. Um, and so the fact that book bans are coming back, that it's every three and a half hours in school districts across the country, according to Penn, is again, horrifying. So how do we even get to the point where we can talk about, like, I feel like the things we were talking about two years ago on, on, um, on, in some of the conferences I was in, which was like, how do you decolonize your bookshelf? Like that was a great conversation that I got to um, be a fly on the wall and listen to at a conference. And it's like, okay, we're just trying to keep books on the shelves at this point. So I wanted to know if we could start talking about that too. Like if we can keep these books, if we can keep what we have and um, it's a lot of work to fight this, um, how do we then like continue onward and continue progressing? So I'm, I'm just curious to see what people think about those two things. Wonderfully provocative questions, um, complex ones as well, Rachel. Um, wonderful presentation. And uh, we learned a lot about indie bookstores as opposed to perhaps um, big box bookstores or chains or franchises. But um, is it not the case that indies are actually on the rise as opposed to on the decline? That is the case. Um, they are on the rise. Book sales in general are on the rise, um, physical. But we're seeing that, um, you know, even especially in relation to Amazon, um, there's huge movement to not purchase from Amazon within the um, indie bookstore community. But independent bookstores, you know, we're also supported by um, the um, ABA, the American Booksellers Association. We're supported by our regional. So we have NABA here in the Northeast. Um, and so last year I actually went on a road trip and went to see all my friends who run indie bookstores, including City of Asylum. I'm so glad you mentioned them because I absolutely adore the folks over there. Um, Exile in Bookville, Javier, um, you know, just a book bar in Denver. I took a whole road trip and just went to go learn from people because I couldn't go to Winter Institute, which is where a lot of booksellers go to meet each other um, because of the pandemic. So the bookstores are doing well and it is a renaissance. Thank you for asking. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Love to hear from you, Keanu. Um, just taking us through the contradictory practices of book banning. Indeed. So um, Beth and Adrian <laughs> spoke a lot in regard to why books are banned, um, the different reasons, the different authors that are banned, the different topics. Now, when we actually look at Common Core State Standards for English Education for grades six through 12. One of the anchor standards states that to become college and career ready, students must grapple with works of exceptional craft and thought whose range extends across genres, cultures, and centuries. Such works offer profound insights into the human condition and serve as models for the student's own thinking and writing. So here's the thing. Common Core State Standards are not just something that is in New York State. These are agreed upon standards that you can see on a variety of state school websites. You can look at school websites in Idaho, Iowa, Maryland, uh, the Dakotas. They all state this because it's an anchor standard, meaning that this is foundational to English education across the United States. Um, so banning books of any degree is extremely contradictory because the majority of the books like Beth had stated um, either have something to do with 
racism, violence, there's homosexuality, drugs, alcohol, suicide, sexually explicit content, things of that nature, which are all unfortunately woven into the fabric of American society. You can go on to the next slide. So I just talked about some of those common reasons. Um, while these reasons are the common reasons, there are several arguments against book bans. Beth had mentioned in the comments that there's a reason or another reason why books like The Bluest Eye and The Hate You Give are banned is because it might make the white reader uncomfortable. And it's not even just the young white reader. It also may make the white teacher reader uncomfortable as well. However, our society in America is becoming more and more um, how should I put it? Colorful. <laughs> so while we do still have a high population of white teachers, we have such a vast variety of cultures and races in our classrooms current day. Um, this lack of awareness can breed ignorance. If we do not give our youth the platform, the space to engage in conversations around these topics, then we continue to perpetuate the hate that we have been seeing for generations. Um, a lack of representation also can lead to disengagement in the educational process. If students do not see protagonists like heroes in books that actually look like them or share their experiences, youth tend to disengage from the reading process. If they never see themselves or if they only see themselves as the villain in books, they become disengaged. Parents do still hold the power to opt out. So this is another reason why we shouldn't be banning books. Um, if you think about the state exams that we have currently, parents left and right, especially with the uh, third through eighth grade uh, tests, I used to teach high school and I also have children that are school age. Um, we always get a letter before those state exams come out that says, hey, if you don't want your kids to take this test, you can opt out. You can keep your kid at home. The same uh, liberty is afforded to adults, parents, when it comes to reading certain texts in classrooms. If they do not want their youth to read that book, they can actually opt out and have their youth taken to a different space during that class period or given another uh, text to read. Um, and the practice, like I said, does not align with common core state standards. If we are really looking to get our youth into a space where not only are they college and career ready, but they're also thinking about possibly becoming authors. If we're censoring what they actually read, if we're censoring the ability for teachers to actually engage in discussions about these texts, we're modeling an air of fear. When teachers feel like they are being threatened, like their livelihood is being threatened by providing different texts to youth, you see that and they're like, you know what? I do have a story to tell, but am I actually gonna be safe in telling it? And we start to stifle future authors. Um, in regard to that comment that Beth made, it really resonated with me um, with making the white reader uncomfortable. We have had several texts throughout time that are in the classic canon that are part of the curriculum that consistently make students of color uncomfortable. There have been works by um, Kate Chopin, Desiree's Baby. It's one of my favorite texts to actually teach that consistently makes students of color uncomfortable based off of the story itself. Um, the Hate You Give was definitely a text that might have been anti-police, but it also talked about the experience of a young black girl having to code switch between communities because of where she went to school versus where she lived. So if we're not actually having these conversations and allowing for schools to do what it is that they're supposed to do, which is provide our youth with a wide array of texts to choose from, while we do have indie bookstores and while we have big box bookstores, we start to create another layer of inequity 
because our youth don't always have access to these bookstores. They also don't have the familiarity with authors and with different texts that they should be able to get through their educational system. Brilliantly put. Thank you, Kiana. Do you have another slide or, yeah. oh, we're moving on to Alex. But I would like to say also one thing that um, is just extraordinary to contemplate is the fact that the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Toni Morrison's beloved, is a banned book. So when you're talking about excellence, I mean, you just go to the craft itself. We have a world famous text that somebody or some group of people have decided to ban. And it's such an important foundational book. So we have canonical books that are selectively, selectively banned. And uh, you, you point to that so beautifully in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And now we get to hear from one of our authors, and this is going to be a very exciting discussion around these issues of that are very personal as well as political. So Alex, please take us through. Great, well, thank you so much, Allison. And um, yes, I just want to share a little bit about uh, my, my story, you know, as I've been listening, I'm realizing, you know, how much I grew up in a uh, time of censorship. And I think that probably goes uh, for many of us. And we just didn't realize that uh, we were growing up under that term censorship. So a little, about, uh, a little bit more about me. As I said earlier, I'm a Mexican immigrant with a Cuban mom and German Mexican dad. And when I was five years old, uh, we moved to the United States. Uh, first of all, we moved to Texas. Next slide, please. And I was also a queer kid, or as my mom put it, I was artistic. Next slide, please. So when I moved to Texas, this was in the 1960s, and there was even more prejudice than there is now. Uh, I was picked on and bullied for being Mexican, for uh, not, not speaking English. Um, I was very fortunate, though, in that uh, my teachers and my librarians, they were always very supportive and, and encouraging. So I learned English as fast as I could. Next slide, please. So when I was in school, the books that taught me to read and write exclusively portrayed white people. Uh, some of you may also remember the Dick and Jane series and all those uh, very white cherubic uh, kids kids in there. And they left out uh, peop any other people, including uh, people like me. Uh, you know, as, as Kiana said, you know, our, we're becoming more colorful as a society, but that color has always been here. And uh, it was uh, kept out of uh, books that, uh, that I grew up with. Bye, please. So to be American, uh, I learned meant to be white. And because of my light-skinned uh, German-Mexican dad, I learned I could pass as white. So I buried my Mexican heritage deep inside me. Stopped speaking Spanish when I'd go out shopping or go to a restaurant with my parents. I'd tell them, speak English, don't speak Spanish. I didn't want anyone to know uh, we were Mexican. Next slide, please. Now, there was one exception to the books that Tommy read, and that was the story of Ferdinand. His character spoke Spanish, and looked like people I knew. You may recall uh, uh, Ferdinand uh, was about the bull that preferred smelling flowers to fighting the bull ring. Next slide, please. In Nazi Germany, I, I, I learned this as I was preparing, uh, Hitler banned the book Ferdinand and demanded it be burned as degenerate propaganda. Next slide, please. But I think to me, the story subconsciously inculcated a timeless message, be true to who you are. Maybe that's the message that the Nazis feared, in which I think probably a lot of parents now fear in terms of banned books. By burying my Mexican heritage, I was no longer different, or so I thought. I was 13 when I first heard the word gay, and I knew that's what I was. 
Now, young people today, they'll be like, it wasn't until you were 13 that, that you heard the word gay. And that's because this was in the dark ages. Next slide, please. Before Will and Grace. When I was growing up, there were no books or media with positive images and stories of people like me. I thought I was the only boy in the world with feelings like mine. Next slide, please. I raced through high school scared, lonely, confused, depressed, once again, hiding who I was, all those feelings I got bottled up inside. At that time, there were no uh, books on the shelves with uh, LGBTQ plus uh, content. I think a, probably, you know, a, a large part of, of the, uh, the uproar among the banned books now is because so many young people are coming out at so um, uh, younger and younger ages. And, uh, you know, part of this conversation is, you know, our society is going through a tremendous cultural change and change can be difficult. You know, different changes for uh, different people can be difficult. And I think uh, uh, there are people who are freaking out about how many kids are coming out young. Next slide, please. In college, I began to meet other LGBTQ plus people and started the long journey of accepting myself as queer and Latino. Uh, began speaking Spanish again, uh, reclaiming that part of my heritage. And part of that process for me came through writing. My first novel was about gay and bisexual boys, including a Latino protagonist. Next slide, please. Uh, part of this conversation too, uh, educator Rudine Sims Bishop coined the idea of books as, next slide please. Mirrors and windows, next slide please. As mirrors, books allow us to see ourselves in stories. They, they can validate, empower, and affirm us. They let us know we're not alone like this teen boy. Next slide, please. This is uh, one of the many, many emails I've got. Hi, Mr. Sanchez. As we know, most of young society today doesn't read unless it's like the Twilight series. But during my freshman year, I had to, I had to do a book presentation. Me being me, I hated reading, especially in English, since I'm bilingual. But the cover of your book, Getting It, got my attention. First, I was like, whatever, I'm not going to read it anyways. But then I read the first chapter and I was like, hey, the main character is Mexican and my age and just like me. The book was so addicting, I just couldn't stop reading. I had to find out more and more of what was going to happen next. I now know the passion for reading. Why? Because of your books. So that's also part of this conversation, you know, as, as uh, others have mentioned, the importance of being able to see ourselves, seeing that mirror of who we are. Next slide, please. That's a mirror. As windows, books help us to see beyond our differences. They help us develop empathy, compassion, understanding. They help to dismantle the biases institutionalized in our society. As this girl describes, another email from a dean. Next slide, please. Dear Mr. Sanchez, I'm a teenage girl who thought it was a great sin against God to be gay. I openly spoke out against anyone who was gay until my English teacher made my class do an assignment on a book that would change my life. I accidentally picked your name out of a hat. When I found out your book was about gay teens, I didn't want anything to do with it. I told my teacher I would take an F rather than read a book about gays. However, I forced myself to read it, and I found myself unable to put the book down. During class, my teachers would have to take the book from my hands so I could focus. Next slide, please. When I was done with the book, I had a whole new outlook on anyone who is gay. I felt ashamed because I was trying to help kids not accept who they are. Soon after that, I joined the Gay Straight Alliance. Within two months, your book became the peace saver in my school. It was no longer in the library. Kids were on the waiting list for it. It joined kids who were gay and who weren't together. So I would like to thank you for writing your books. Thank you for giving me a whole new pair of eyes.
Next slide, please. Okay. Sorry about that. When we exclude books, when we exclude people of color or LGBTQ plus people from books and libraries, we imply that anyone who is LGBTQ plus or non-white doesn't belong, doesn't exist, doesn't deserve to exist. We perpetuate biases. Next slide, please. I'm fortunate to have published 10 novels for young people found in schools and libraries across the country. Nine of them have been challenged or banned. The latest one apparently isn't on the radar quite yet. Next slide, please. In all these books, my agent says, they all tell the same story. Be true to who you are. Maybe that's the message people who ban books fear will be heard by their children. That's it. And I look forward to uh, answering your questions when we get to our Q&A. Thanks so much. I loved uh, following your journey, Alex, um, in this personal way. Thank you. And we also thank you for your books. Um, recently, you've been doing graphic novels, which um, open up a whole other dimension. Back in the day, you know, um, comic books were banned. You know about that. They were supposed to be morally, <laughs> morally bad for children. Um, and, and that was a, a, a huge uh, movement that went across the United States as well. That was beautiful, Alex. Thank you. So now I think um, we're going to hear from Francesca, another one of our authors who has some, uh, whose book is just beautiful. I'm reading it right now, as a matter of fact. Thank you, Francesca, for taking us through. Wow, I, I don't know what to say. Thank you so much for uh, reading my book. Um, so yeah, my, uh, my, part of the presentation is a little bit different because although I am an author I'm like my book is a little baby because it was just born last month and I have not had the pleasure of having it be challenged um, and honestly I'm just sitting here kind of blown away at um, Alex's presentation at the letters in particular uh, definitely started to thaw my cold cold heart tonight. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, so just to reintroduce myself, uh, my name is Francesca Padilla or Francesca or Fran or Franny. Um, I'm known as like as Franny Padilla in, in um, my social media. Um, so I am a young adult author with a new book out. Um, it's my, my debut novel. Um, and with Soho Press, as I said, it's, it's an imprint, the teen imprint of Soho. Um, Soho books. <laughs> I'm Soho Press. I sort of had a blanking moment. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about what the book is about, because it does contain a lot of the themes that make books uh, get challenged. Um, so it is about a 17 year old girl living in a fictional Long Island town called Nautilus, New York. And it is um, so there, it's it's a bit of a mix of coming of age and like a thriller mystery. Um, and it's about a girl named Minerva Gutierrez who um, has been sort of abandoned by her mother's um, hospitalization. Uh, her mom has been in and out of the hospital a lot. So she's sort of been neglected, left on her own. Um, they're very poor because her mom hasn't been able to work um, because she was sick um, with a heart condition. And um, they, so they're really struggling and uh, she finds that she, she lands a job um, and because it's sort of like the outskirts and it's like um, not a city, <laughs> um, everybody's kind of like, uh, the job that she gets um, is one that a lot of people want. It's at an ice cream stand and it's, um, and people will tell her that she's supposed to be really grateful for it, but uh, her boss turns out to be um, kind of a monster <laughs> and, um, and uh, harasses the, the girls who work there. Um, and he has like a policy where he only hires girls who are cute. Um, and so <laughs> there's a lot going on. And so when there's an, an armed robbery one day, it sort of uncovers that her boss is actually doing shady things and hiding money. And it turns into this like hunt for the money because if she and her friend um, can find the, or slash drug dealer neighbor, um, Cece, 
if they can find this, they can, um, yeah, Soho Press is awesome. They're really great. I love working with them. Uh, <laughs> so if we can, if they can find the money, uh, then the, all their problems will be solved and then antics ensue. So again, it's coming of eight. So there's, so on one hand, she's grappling with um, abandonment and um, uh, issues of anticipatory grief, as I call it in the book, where she knows her mother is going to die one day and um, having to deal with that and anger, you know, seething anger is a big part of the book. And then, um, and then this mystery that's sort of like kind of a fun little romp. Uh, well, not little in my opinion, but it's a fun romp. Um, and so Minerva is uh, like me, she's Dominican. She's also, she's Puerto Rican as well. Um, I myself am um, just Dominican, um, but I have many Puerto Rican family members and family members who are Dominican and something else. And there are also a lot of characters, uh, a few characters in the book who are, you know, from multiple places. Um, and it's not necessarily like from multiple Spanish speaking countries. For example, there's a character who's Afro Honduran and Colombian. And um, like one of the things that I, that I was thinking about <laughs> when I was writing the book was like, are white people gonna understand that like people can be from more than one country? I don't know. And then I just had to sort of be like, whatever. Um, and so in this book, uh, in writing it, uh, I definitely used, my own experience uh, living in extreme poverty um, uh, with a chronically ill parent, um, a single parent household. I've also been uh, sexually and emotionally harassed at work as a teenager, like Minerva. Um, it's funny, uh, I've also been harassed at work when I uh, worked next to the Broadway bull, <laughs> the charging bull. So it's like that really brought stuff back when it was mentioned earlier in this session. Um, and so there's really no way that I could have written this story without with any with any kind of like depth or you know with any kind of depth uh, had I not experienced those things in real life. Um, and yet like even even describing these experiences as we've seen uh, is grounds to offend people and upset people. Uh, the other thing that the book has is it's very anti-police. Um, the boss in the book is uh, like loves police. And if you're familiar with like, I mean, this is suburban communities and all over, um, but you know, this was inspired especially by um, how things are downstate, like the Long Island area and like Queens and how there's, you know, there's like the cops and the firefighters and they're like upper, mid upper middle class. And then there's like kind of everybody else. <laughs> Um, and so those are the, the boss in the book is just like, he's like, he, he's really into police. He loves police and the, they have the police come to the fire. I'm sorry, to the ice cream stand and they get free ice cream and they harass the girls. And so, and there's like, you know, there's multiple moments that are very clearly like, this isn't like you're misusing your power. Like this is white supremacy in action. Um, and so it's funny that, uh, so the reason, so again, so these are all things that I've, I've seen in real life. Um, I've put it on the page because I was really freaking angry about it. Um, and so the, I, what I wanted to mention uh, is that as a debut author, I, so it's been one month since my book has been out, one month and change. And um, I, I definitely live in fear of being, of having my book be challenged of, not necessarily offending people because that's literally the last thing I care about. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I care about offending. That's not, that's not so true. Like I obviously don't wanna offend my readers but I don't care about offending people who are against the things that I talked about, you know? Like people who, who are like, oh, Blue Lives Matter is wonderful or, <laughs> you know, like all these things. No, like, I don't care about offending those people, but I do see that already I have seen feedback of like, you know, I don't approve of the behavior in this book. And I just, I think this is, you know, one, one person who left very early feedback was like, well, I'm a, as a former public defender, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't approve of the behavior in this book. And I, you know, and as an author, you're not, really supposed to respond <laughs> to, to feedback like that um and so I you know you just kind of let it sit but I saw that feedback and I was like okay hey, my father was in prison for 10 years um let's talk because I also have perspective on this matter um so 
So whatever. Um, so another thing that I wanted to mention is that um, people I've had, you know, ever since my book deal happened, um, I've had people tell me every so often, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if your book got banned because it has, you know, substance use and it has um, LGBTQ characters and it has, you know, all the things that I just said. And I'm like, every single time I'm like, no, because that's money out of my pocket. That's uh, fewer people having access to what's in the book. And um, that's not, and it's, and a lot, I, what I've realized is that the people who don't, who aren't in the work that we're doing and that we're talking about, they don't understand that book banning is more than just, we have decided to ban this book and it gets more attention and money to the book. Like so much of book challenging and book banning is so quiet and really just, you don't even know about it and you never know about the book or you're much less likely to know about the book because some person decided that it hurt their feelings for reasons that really should be talked about. <laughs> so, um, Franny, yeah. could I ask you um, about some of your uh, women literary heroes? Because as we're talking about what books do get into the hands of younger readers, who are some, what are some of the books that had they been banned, would not have been in your hands, but that you did engage with and mostly out of school, you were discovering these things on your own, but um, gave you the, the, uh, the model for speaking your truth and for um, creating a character this and this kind of trauma-informed um, YA book. Who were some of uh, your literary her heroes who um, made you feel that you could authentically represent your reality. Right, so, um, all right. So that's when someone asks you, what are your favorite books and authors? It's like deer in headlights, but um, Beloved was already mentioned today. And I already said in the chat that it's my favorite book. I think it is just like a, <laughs> it's just like a force. It's, there's nothing like that book. Um, so Beloved is definitely one. I read The Bluest Eye before I read Beloved and that one, like the first few pages of that book really, really sucked me in. I'd never seen anything like that where it talks about um, colorism and uh, <laughs> what it's like to, you know, and, and how like, oh, don't like aspiring to, to not be a person of color. And like, that was just really eye-opening for me. I read that um, in college. When I was younger, um, there wasn't really, you know, like Alex, like there for me, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of work. Uh, there weren't a lot of books that had characters like me that I had access to, um, and so there, there is a lot of adjustment that takes place when you grow up without that kind of media like you have to be like well I'm I am now empathizing with this person who's nothing like me because I just really like reading about reading stories so there's a little bit of that that I that I want to mention but um the first book that I can recall uh that really was like oh I, I can actually do this was a book called Nilda by Nicolasa Moore um and it was about I think it was written in the 50s or 60s um but I read it in the 90s and it was a book about like a low income Puerto Rican girl um, in, in Spanish Harlem. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it was like the first like literary novel about, you know, not a white person <laughs> that I had come across. Um, so that was, that was really big. Um, my other favorites are uh, I, Jasmine Ward. I would read literally anything by Jasmine Ward. <laughs> like I would read her grocery list. Um, and yeah, a lot of a lot of young adult books that have been banned. I did want to mention The Hate You Give. Uh, what I know of that book is that it was tremendously, it continues to be tremendously successful. Um, it made a really big splash. Um, so first, uh, Angie Thomas got that that grant that I also got a year, like the following year. Um, but uh, she all, the book was also bought through like a really like a 12 house auction or something like that. And so that's what I think of when I hear they hate you. That's what I think of is like major, major success, like just nothing like it. Right. Um, but 
it just goes to show you and it's also the reason that I put the starred reviews in the slide is like you know critical reception positive critical reception doesn't prevent you from being a target <laughs> and so I've seen that with that book and that author and I've seen I've seen people I think it was alluded to way earlier today or way earlier tonight like um there that that authors just kind of sometimes they have to disappear from social media I've seen it dozens and dozens of times um I'm very active on social media so uh so yeah it's 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 scary <laughs> it's scary to to behold um Right. Well, thank you for your courage. And you and Alex are writing the kinds of texts that are so inspirational for our young people now. So, you know, good on you. Keep on, keep on with the with the mission. It's terrific. And the writing is beautiful. Um, so I'm wondering how we're doing on time, Calvin, and if we should open this up to questions or do we have more to cover? Yeah, we, we can. Yeah, we, we can certainly open up um, the Q&A now. Um, we can st stop our screen share. Um, and I have I have a question. Um, we don't have so far, if you're if you're open if you're in the audience members, please raise the virtual hand or pop your question in the chat. But I wanted to ask a question that's sort of um, very curiously burning in my mind for Alex. You shared those beautiful letters that came through from readers. Um, I'm curious, out of the nine books, Alex, that you mentioned that have been banned or challenged, um, what what have what have, when it first happened? Maybe going back to like the first book, um, what was that like experience like for you as an author? Like, how did you feel? What what emotions came up for you? And and since then, how has that maybe changed? Yeah, well, thank you so much for the question. So, uh, you know, it was it was. Uh, very scary when my book was going to be published, just a lot of fear about, you know, being, being uh, you know, attacked, not physically, but, you know, attacked in media or whatever. And, you know, just brought back uh, all the all the shame and guilt uh, about growing up queer and uh, the bullying just brought it all back in preparation. But what happened was that when the book came out, the, the, the emails just started, you know, first trickling in and then flooding in you know, emails like the ones, you know, I, I read to you. And, you know, I've, uh, you know, literally received thousands of uh, those as opposed to probably less than 20 negative, negative emails. So I think, you know, as, as we started uh, opening up the discussion, talking about the, the positives, I think is also very important that, you know, yes, it, it's, it's uh, a, a terrible and uh, what, what's happening in terms of the fans, but to remember that, you know, again, one of the reasons this is occurring is because our culture has changed so much in, in a very positive direction in terms of acceptance and, 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 and diversity. And I think it's, uh, it's just so important to constantly be emphasizing that, you know, I read a Publishers Weekly article that, you know, more LGBTQ themed books were published last year than ever any year previously. Uh, part of the reason, you know, the bans are coming up is because there are so many books with, uh, uh, you know, diverse characters, people of color, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus characters being published that, uh, you know, it, uh, I think it's hard to stop that, that tide. You know, as a Adrian said, you can't ban reality. And this is the reality of our culture, our, our society, how, how it has changed. So for me, what's been really important is, you know, uh, people like you all, uh, you know, I, librarians are so incredibly so supportive. So throughout the process, it's like when the, also what happens is as, as an author, I'm, I'm oftentimes the last people, the last person to hear about a ban. I'm not on the front lines as the, the same way that teachers and librarians are, you know, dealing with the, the, the parents, the community members who are, who are um, making these these attacks, and uh, so I've I've always felt very uh, supported through the process. I've you know, uh, uh, you know, cultivated a, a supportive uh, community. You know, even uh, uh, groups like uh, Writers and Books here in, in Rochester. You know, have, having that support because uh, uh, writing is is a, is a lonely process, a solitary process. So getting that support is is. Uh, really important. So 
Yeah, just I know that answers your question, but those are some of the, the things that have happened for me. Thank you, Alex. Allison, do you have a, another question or should I, I'm happy to continue. I, see well, hand uh, I don't know if I looked in the chat and I'm not seeing a question um, yet, but I did have a question for any and all of our panelists and that's about uh, critical race theory. And I know that that also is um, an area that crosses over into our concerns about uh, censorship and banned books. And um, I think we all have probably have a, a common understanding about what the concept of critical race theory is, but I know that there's been a lot of reactionary um, kind of movement around that. And if uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, the intersection between this, the, the debate <laughs> or the furor or the concern over critical race uh, theory um, and this topic we're talking about man books and then Laura has a question hand raised so um maybe we'll just ask you to respond to that and then we'll go to Laura thank you I I have some thoughts as a you know as somebody who runs a public library you know through so a library collection, a public library collection is built over decades, right? So we're, we have books sitting out on the shelves that have, have been there a long time. That's what a library is. Uh, and so if you have these books, which is the case that were published from one point of view, you know, through, uh, you know, years and years and years, the collection is so skewed to one, point of view and I think that for me to be able to see history particularly portrayed you know in in these different ways like this is correcting a problem in the collection no doubt um and it, it's it's so mystifying to me to hear this pushback against something that clearly is it just is, again, I go back to this is reality, whether you like it or not, it, it, it this is what is, and it, it, um, it is troubling to think about that this is even a conversation at schools that we would not be having, you know, that kind of education in schools, and I think even in my own, I grew up in Kendall, um, those of you who are local may or may honestly not know Kendall, it's a very rural town to the west on Lake Ontario. And I had 60 people in my graduating class, you know, and I knew nothing. <laughs> I learned so little in school about anything that was outside of my community. And how much more interesting, I would have listed social studies on the bottom of even below math, which I hated, um, you know, because it was boring to me. But I think now, boy, these resources, I got to think kids are so much more engaged um, to really be able to learn about other people who are maybe not like them. Uh, I don't think that that's just for, you know, I don't think these things are just for people of color. I don't think they're just for LGBTQ kids. They're for everybody to learn about the human condition you know so i this this i feel like critical race theory has just how it's become so politicized seems so weird to me i'm so grateful that we have these materials and that we're able to start correcting the imbalance in our collections can i just add to that it just reminded me of something that i saw online that I was just like itching to, to repeat to someone else, which was a TikTok, which is fun to say. I saw a TikTok that was like, um, it was a, a young person talking about growing up uh, in a mixed race household. The person was white, um, but they had a black sibling and they were talking about like the different treatment that they noticed. And they said something that really struck me, which was, we don't learn about things like racism or sexism from books and from TV and movies. We don't. We learn about it from real life. <laughs> and then we use the media 
to process what we have what we have learned in real life and to have guideposts and to have spaces to actually like understand so I don't know like I have to sit and think about if I agree that we don't learn necessarily from books but I definitely feel like we learn more from real life um and 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 I definitely agree that we have to use that books are a are the place to um, to process what we've seen in real life, which is so important. <laughs> well, for sure, um, it's easy to spot when a book is inauthentic, when it's not ma matching up with what is real. Um, so uh, I thank you for that point. And Kiana, it looks like you're about to say something. Yeah, so I think one of the things that we often forget is critical race theory is actually just, it's not even like, what is commonly seen in the media as being like a race baiting situation or something to just stoke unnecessary fires. It's just looking at history critically. So when we talk about book bans and critical race theory and couple them, um, we have to always go back to the fact that it sounds absurd, but when you think about the fact that book banning and critical race theory um, are kind of at odds with each other because it's a matter of power. Those who are in power do not want to relinquish power. That is why we have book bans. Critical race theory is not trying to attack the system that is in place. It's trying to shed light on systems that have been put in place that have consistently put people of color in not only a minority when it comes to policy, but their placement in this society. So it's not kind of crazy for me when I hear about it um, because those who are normally in power don't want to relinquish power. Um, those who have created policies that have created generational wealth for their families and families of their friends don't normally want to share that generational wealth. So until we actually, as a collective, start to look at the books that are being written currently um, with a critical eye and allow the next generation of youth to have these discussions, we're going to continue to see what we see uh, from generation to generation. Thank you. Um, um, I would. I just wanted to, to yes, add yes. one um, one thing. Um, I think that um, from the reading that I, I've been doing, um, the um, critical race theory has been, um, it's really been turned into a sort of catch-all um, scare tactic, um, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> signal that um, something is, um, is is inappropriate. Um, I mean, it and it's it really has become um, the a reason to uh, some of, some of the picture books that are are being banned. Are there's the the one um, the one the award winning one that was about the the Tulsa um, uh, massacre. There's a children's book. I read um, there's a a book um, separate is never equal in one school district said oh we can have the book but you're not allowed to read these two pages and then, then I got sick and so I couldn't pull the book and find out because I was going to post the two pages and be like oh everybody look at these pages but it's it's become sort of this catchphrase sort of catch-all for um you know back to the the history that that makes us uncomfortable the history that um you know challenges your view um, this this view that we've sort of for generations had of the um, um, the just goodness of America and what it and what it stands for, and there's um, it's it's scary for like we were talking about the cultural change is scary. Um, I think it's scary for the people in power who are who are banning these books. But if you talk to kids. Um, who are who are learning these things that we might see as difficult? It's 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 not difficult. They're ready to talk about these things, and it's sort of, you know, I was um, when um, um, Franny was talking, and it, you know, she has the coming of age novels. Like, uh oh, like that's another catchphrase. It's like this coming of age, this sort of 
this emergence from innocence, I feel like a lot of people want to protect their kids from and like, oh, they can't, they shouldn't learn about, about, you know, um, teen pregnancy or with like, when, in, you know, when I was in high school, it was like, oh, any, any books about drugs, like, ooh, you read it, read up and then you're going to have drugs. Um, it, it just, it's, it's the fear of, of not, it's, it's the fear of the truth and how your kids are going to be able to handle it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, as far as a buzzword, it's more like a signal that if you, if, if you calling something CRT, that means that it needs it, then it's sort of a signal that this is a, a crazy liberal idea that's trying to tell kids that America okay. is bad. It's sort of become that. Thank you. I'm going to move on to um, Laura to make sure she has time to offer her comment or question. Oh, thanks, Allison. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all the presenters, too. Um, and uh, this has been great. I work at Penfield Public Library, and um, I'm a clerk. So um, this has been a big topic this week, certainly, but um, often on my mind. And what I was curious about is if anyone had, like, if there's good resources for, this kind of falls in line with, like, the idea of, like, power and like the smaller publishers whose books get banned or smaller authors, their debut books um, that are done through smaller presses, like uh, never really getting out there, never, um, never getting, you know, they don't get the big buzz from being banned because they barely made it out there in the first place. And um, I know, you know, some you can find and, um, you know, doing book clubs, or trying to feature them in displays in the library is like one possibility, but I just didn't know if other people had, um, and obviously small bookstores carrying the titles or mentioning them to people who own small bookstores or things like that. Um, but yeah, just thinking about the people who uh, get banned right from, right from go and they never get their story out there. Uh, open that up, please, to panelists. Please jump in. Well, just I, I have something to share around that, not not from the perspective of live librarians and public libraries, but from just the perspective of just making sure that we we remind ourselves, right, that the publishing industry, book publishing industry, is still very white. Although there is, there's been a huge proliferation of. Um, books published by authors like Alex and Francesca and their stories, the, the people who make the decisions on what books to publish, especially from, you only really have like three or four large publishing houses. It's, a, it's almost, I don't want to call it a monopoly, but you know, that's why we have this press. You, like can, you can call it a monopoly. <laughs> Soho Press and, you know, people like Ampersand and Allison is, is, is deeper in this industry um, than I am in terms of career, but, you know, just the idea of whose book even gets published, right? Like, usually we have to go through these smaller publishing houses or even self-publishing is because there's still very few people of color, um, diverse people, non-white people who, are, who don't identify as white, who are making the decision of even, does this story, is this story worth telling, right? And so we, even though we do have this renaissance, if you will, of of books being published by people that look like Francesca and Alex and share experiences and backgrounds, there's still a lot more to be done in terms of like the gatekeeping of 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 authors getting book deals, to be very honest. And so that's like before you even get the idea of your book in the library, you have to actually get the book published. And so that's a huge conversation that we could have a whole other, and I'm sure we will, a whole other program um, thinking of writers and books and their literary conference and even how how to break through the industry as a Black woman, as a Black queer person, as a non-binary present or identifying person is still very, very difficult. Yeah, if I could, if I could add something uh, too, is a good resource is uh, we need diverse books. Uh, that organization, which has, has done and continues to do a lot, both in terms of developing uh, diverse authors and uh, also now, and also putting pressure on, on publishing 
and the major publishing houses in terms of uh, diversity uh, in, in, in publishing. So we need diversebooks.org. Thank you, Alex. And um, Rachel, you may um, agree with me that the small press industry is really healthy right now, that ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> and there's a sense in which, because they are so focused on bringing marginalized voices to the center of awareness, there is a kind of message to the big four. However, my concern is that that goes in waves and it's still all mostly about um, impression management and being on the, the uh, profitable, <laughs> on the, on the pro you know, looking at their profit margins. I'm thinking back to before your time, Rachel, um, this was in the 70s when um, Anchor Doubleday, which now since absorbed by a bigger company, uh, they brought out very vigorously um, an African-American, African-American centric book list. And it wasn't just um, classics or from the canonical works we recognize today, like from the Harlem Renaissance, but it was really pushing, you know, the Black arts movement and contemporary books, and they were very uh, vigorously behind it. And then it completely dried up. It, that wave lasted maybe 15 years at, at the most. But I do think, and I, um, I don't know if we have time, but Rachel, I think the small presses do do some of that work that we're talking about. Yeah, and uh, so it's so it's kind of a collaborative effort. So what um, Calvin is saying is is absolutely true. We need these publishers to have editors who are the ones who are looking through works. Um, and there's also a big difference between, um, especially if you're a white publisher or a white owned bookstore or a cisgender publisher, cisgender owned bookstore. Um, there's a there's a big difference you want to make sure that you're not tokenizing at the same time right so uh this is something that we talk about a lot like we carried the book juneteenth at akimbo right um i'm not gonna post that on juneteenth uh it's here every day of the year um it feels very uncomfortable to like market that right so so there's there's a way in which you uplift and elevate and then also keep yourself in check and and think about how exactly you're um, raising up other voices. Um, we have a selection, a good selection of transgender authors in the store. Um, none of my son's friends have, you know, um, cisgender pronouns. Almost all of them are they, them pronouns, you know? Um, I want his friends to feel comfortable when they walk in my store. I want them to see themselves on these shelves, but it, it's definitely really important that the small bookstores work with small presses. And so it's our job to make sure that we're supporting them and that we're carrying these titles. Publishers only do well when we are carrying their books. So we have a big say in that. Unfortunately, it is capitalism and capitalist frameworks are as such. But um, so, you know, you can sell what sells. So we have to make sure that we're supporting those publishers that are doing a good job. And so when we have diverse voices, um, I, I focus on literature and translation. It's a love of mine. And there are a lot of small uh, presses that publish literature and translation. But when we talk about decolonizing our shelves, like this shelf behind me here is uh, entirely translated from another language. The problem with that is that that gets Eurocentric really quickly you can have German and Russian and French authors all day long. So you have to really think and just be careful and make sure that the people in your community walk in and see themselves prominently displayed. And that means everybody. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I know we're running out of time and Calvin, you want to do a wrap. I just first want to thank, thank this amazing panel. You've brought so much wisdom, so much insight, and so many challenges to this discussion. We appreciate you. Thank you. We always run out of time. It's, it feels like a lot of time until you get all of these experts and authors and thought leaders in together. And so um, we'll pull up our, our final slide, slide 54. And we, we, we wanted to make sure that we did end this conversation on a positive note. We've talked a lot about action and 
keeping yourself informed, you know, sharing this program, those of you who are here live and, you know, share it to those who are not here to watch in the future on demand um, is really important. Writing your authors, which we saw how the, the, the power in those letters that Alex shared. Um, and also um, supporting your local bookstores and buying books that center experiences of people who are Dominican, who are Latinx, who, who identify as Afro-Latino like Francesca. So our next slide is just a, a number of ways in which we can, within the confines of capitalism, which is also a whole other conversation, which I would love to um, explore some programming with Rachel around these conversations. But for those of you who are, are, are um, familiar with the Rochester, New York, um, greater Rochester area, um, Writers and Books on University Avenue, Ampersand, their local bookstore, Akimbo on East Avenue, and also Hippocampo Books on South Avenue here locally are three of the local bookstores that I support the most and sort of ping pong between all three of you um, with my dollars when I'm purchasing books. Um, I read a lot of books, so I'm often, um, I have my library card. You should, even if you don't check out books from the library, you should sign up for a local library card in your local area. If you're not from Monroe County, um, I take out a lot of books virtually, digitally, as someone who's disabled. So having that Libby service with the library system and being able to check out books digitally is so important. And um, libraries are not also just for books. Libraries are really like a community resource that don't get enough funding. That could be its own conversation, I'm sure, with Adrian, Beth, and Kate. So support your local library system and then really support um, book authors like Alex, whose most recent book, You Brought Me the Ocean, um, Fran, who's book is just a, a month old, What's Coming to Me. And then um, Writers and Books is um, going to be engaging in its annual Rochester Reads program. So if you go to wab.org, you can learn about the, the, the spotlight book for this year's programs, which is a collaboration across um, libraries and other institutions locally is supporting the book Jason Mott, Hell of a Book. Um, a novel, another um, Black author as well. So as, as we've shared, um, we can't support um, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, et cetera, transgender, non-binary authors enough in, in, through the purchasing and support of their books. And so these are just a few from our, our, our amazing um, author panelists today and others. And, um, Thank you all for joining us this evening. On the next slide, you can connect with 540 West Main. You'll, you'll get a survey as well. We're on all socials um, under 540W Main. I mean, also Writers and Books is on social media and their website, wab.org. Um, thank you to Beth, Rachel, Kiana, Alex, Fran, Kate, Adrian, Allison, um, Dan, the Writers and Books team, and the 540 team for your curation and planning. Um, we would not have been able to put this on without all of your support. Um, and we really look forward to continuing to read and write um, and amplify the truth and the facts and, and, and you know, both the good and the bad of our, of our social culture and experiences. And that's really what we're all about at 540 West Main and Writers and Books as well. So thank you all for joining us and we hope that you have a wonderful evening and um, make sure that you do some reading. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.